Okay, so we're back. Um, we're going to get into some of the actual detail. Like, if we could pinpoint a moment here, you seem to have a... You've remembered a specific moment. A specific moment that you could trace your exact... Um, you could trace back to sort of acting out, right? Um, so one thing I found was when my sister was in the hospital, um, I would get comfort in the little mad friends that I had. And so I would often go and hang out with her and my parents would just allow that because they were at the hospital. So they, they're like, yeah, at least she's spending time with somebody. Um, and there was one time when I went to the hospital, or, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I went to my friend's house with, um, I'm sorry. Okay, for sure. Um, a major moment in my mental health story was when I went to my friend's house and she had had her boyfriend over. Uh, I was 12, almost 13 at the time, and my friend was 15. I had always, uh, felt more of a connection to older people and her boyfriend was 16 and his he had brought a friend as well and the parents were away I forget why I believe they were at a party or they were not there overnight and her and her boyfriend wanted some alone time so she asked if it'd be all right if she went upstairs to her bedroom and I was in the basement with a friend uh, I believe we were watching I can't, can't quite remember what we were watching, but it was a cartoon. Um, and uh, the friend, whose name I'm not, I'm not going to say, but uh, he had went and closed the door to the basement and locked it. And I thought, that that's weird, but okay. You know, I, I was very innocent. I never really thought anything bad could happen. And he had come over and... He put his arm on my leg, and I remember moving his arm and moving over on the couch. And I was at the point where I was crushing on boys, but never to the point where I was actually making moves. And he had um, put his hand back on my leg and said, no, don't, don't, don't you like me touching you? And I didn't know how to respond. I'm like, no, no, I don't. Like, can you please move your hand? And he didn't. Um, long story short, I was put in a very uncomfortable position. And I had I had said no. I clearly, clearly said no. And he forced me down on the ground and forced my clothing off. And... Uh, he had his, I remember, he had his arm, or I'm sorry, his hand on my throat, and I was having troubles breathing. I didn't, I didn't really quite understand what was going on, and I felt, I think, the, the worst kind of pain I'd ever felt. It was it, my lower stomach, uh, very strong, and then it went away, and I realized I was bleeding, and when he had finished, he pulled out, finished on my stomach, and then said that I was his little slut, and that I liked it, and that it was my fault. And I went to the bathroom. He, or I guess, I guess I would say he would, he pushed me into the bathroom, and he said, if, I, if you tell anyone about this, they'll just get mad at you, because you know you wanted it. And I went. I curled up in a ball on the ground and I cried. I I cried and cried and cried until my friend showed up. And my friend had knocked on the door and I, I, I didn't I didn't know what to say. I my underwear was completely full of blood. Uh, so I tried to I threw that out. I watered that up with a bunch of paper towel, threw that out. I tried cleaning myself out and I opened the door and she saw me a wreck. She's like, what's, what's wrong? She she didn't assume anything. And I just said, my stomach's really sore. My stomach's really sore, and I, 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 I don't know what's wrong. Uh, so she sent the boys home, and 
I, I think that was the point where I really knew that there was uh, evil that lived in the world. Okay. So, we were just off mic talking a bit more about this. You were diagnosed with multiple things after this. Well, years after, right? Um, so, after that happened, I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about it. I was really embarrassed. I 110% thought it was my fault. Uh, after my first suicide attempt mentioned earlier, I claimed it just depression um, and anxiety. And they're like, okay, you're okay. And my second hospital visit where I had, um, that I actually hadn't attempted suicide or basically it was me. My counselor was like, I don't believe you're safe. So I'm going to me, I'm going to call the cops and you're going to go to the hospital. And, um, I was diagnosed with a personality disorder uh, and depression, which kind of, they link together this personality disorder and depression, and as well as PTSD. So was there straight away a push for, for you to be on meds? Are you on meds now? Um, at first they did put me on very mild meds, very just, you know, anti-anxiety medication. And when I complained of headaches, they took me off of that. And they actually, there was a push, um, with my second hospital visit to put me on more serious medication. But one thing that I can say that was positive was they were more or less, pushing for conversation and opening up in therapy and um, DBT, which is dialectic behavioral therapy, uh, as opposed to just relying on the medication. I don't know how much experiences you have with other people who have, like right now, who have like a... Actually, let's back up a bit. So before we even recorded, you were saying that you don't really mess with social media anymore um what, what's your what's your friend network like right now um basically uh recently anyway i've isolated myself and i would have to say that i have maybe one maybe two friends at the most who i talk to once twice a week my my entire social network is based off of who i talk to at work basically Okay, and we spoke about the whole Facebook and Snapchat thing. Um, I was reading something about they rated the different sites, um, which ones are the worst for mental health, and then Instagram got rated. In the UK, actually. The UK, Instagram was considered the worst. How, if you were to sort of give a... I don't want to say word of advice or warning or anything, but what what do you think about social media, the pros and the cons on mental health? Do you think that it's do you think that it's necessary, but also you got to monitor it, or do you think that just people should just not be on there because of the whole effect it has on mental health? I actually think that's a really good question, and my personal philosophy is if you're going to have social media, is so important to just monitor who's on your social media who's seeing what you're posting like i had so many negative people and i never thought to block them or to especially even with something as simple as instagram um i had been in a situation and i had posted something on instagram and i had some negative comments on there and you know it's as simple as maybe making your instagram private or hey i don't i don't know that person and not letting that person follow you and i would say that social media itself is not bad it's just the connections that you can get on it can be really negative towards your mental health and the biggest thing is just saying who do I want to talk to and who do I want to talk to me 
What do I want to see? And what do I want people to see from me? Are the medical professionals, the psychiatrists and all of them, and the therapists, do they talk about this social media thing with you? Like, do they talk, or do they even, do they factor it in? They must factor it in. I, I would, I would hope so. Do you think they are up on the current state of, I mean, I just spoke about a study, but do you think in general that they kind of make the connection? So with my experience, um, because a lot of, uh, I had a lot of negative social media experience that was directly related to my degrading mental health. Uh, a lot of the professional mental health professionals I talked to, there was a, a certain level of understanding. Uh, I would say that most of them just couldn't quite understand why I didn't just block that person or why I didn't just delete that picture or, you know, put that on private. Um, a lot of them didn't understand why I had to respond to that message. Um, but I did have, I would say a good, like 60% of them would just say, yeah, delete it, De- delete it. It's no good for you. But I, I had a good, I had a good percentage of people willing to help me say, okay, you, you can do this with your settings. You can make it so that only family can see this. And I, I, I think those people helped me most because instead of giving me unrealistic goals, they said like, this is what's healthy and there's so many different ways that you can put security on on men, on, on sorry on social media so i would say yeah a good 60 percent didn't understand and a good 40 actually did understand um and you you've spoken about speaking engagements that you've done uh, right you've done speaking engagements at schools and spoken to kids and I imagine, actually, let's talk about it. I'm not going to try and drill questions out of you. Let's talk about it a bit. Um, so I've done multiple speeches. I've done one at an award ceremony where I received an award for resiliency. And basically, I received the award and I knew that a lot of people in the room were struggling with mental health. And I said, it gets better. Even though maybe at myself, myself at that point didn't quite feel it, I knew that saying it would give strength to these people around me. Um, and I also did another speech at an elementary school, just kind of not going hard into the idea of the how horrible mental health can, can how certain mental health issues can be very bad, but just kind of opening to, up to the idea that you can talk to everybody and just putting through my situation, I guess. And as you do these, okay, so as you do these speeches, um, how much of it is just your life or do you like research things and then try and relay info? So personally, I do just um, my life experiences. Um, I tend to be, when I do my speeches, I am with other people who do know the information. And so my part of the speech is basically sharing my experience. And their part of the speech would be giving the information and the percentages and everything. Okay. Okay. Now, this is a question. This is tied to the med- medication question. Uh, I, had to, I had to bookmark this in my head because I wanted to try and, you know, wrap around to this theme. Do you, do you notice that um, you may have noticed there's this huge thing with, like, mindfulness and wellness and, like, you, know, you look like, yeah, you, you have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> the reaction that I just got here to that since you guys can't see us. But... Um, how much of it is the, how much of the, is there a connection in the mindfulness and like yoga world and all of these spiritual things that are coming about? And then the medical professional world, how much is, how much overlap is there? Is the mindfulness and wellness world just like a money making thing? Is it just too twinky dinky? Like, you know what I mean? What are your thoughts on this? So I could go into an hour speech on this, but my basic thoughts are that the spiritual and the medical side of things should can actually correlate 
very well between each other. Um, I am on an antidepressant, but along with that antidepressant, they stress the idea of mindfulness and dialectic behavioral therapy. And basically, they're trying to say, we're giving you these medications, but if you do this, if your mind is calm and at ease, it'll help so much more. So... (laughs) Especially in the current day, I'm so proud to say that people are not just saying, yeah, yoga or yeah, medication. We're kind of saying we need to mix these two for the best result. Yeah, okay, that's great. That's interesting. I was actually expecting you to be like, oh, the spiritual, the yoga stuff is trash or whatever. I didn't, because, you know, I think there's a, there's a connection that needs to be if explored more or focused on more so they don't to either side don't just write each other off sometimes in these sometimes on this show quote unquote show I guess you could call it <laughs> it's like I have this it's not a personal beef but sometimes I get into this beef with you know motivational posts you know when people post okay so you have thoughts on that too what are your thoughts on inspiration and motivational posts on whatever i mean you're not on social media right now but what do you think about that kind of a thing self-help books what are your thoughts on that too self-help books as well it's a lot of questions but so personally i find um, a lot of self-help or personal motivation or these posts on instagram about um I do appreciate things like Bell Let's Talk where people post and then hashtag Bell Let's Talk because it's opening things. But there's some times that I would go on, I would go on Facebook and I would see this person's post about how they went through this and how they're so open and loving. And then I just, I know them in person and they're a horrible human being. (laughs) And there's some of these books that talk about help and it's just so linear they say if you do this you feel better if you do this i'm i'm big on mental health and i'm really big on people sharing experiences but it has to be legitimate to me like if i see something videos are much better like if i see a video about somebody talking about their mental health i can see their body language and i can connect to them so much more than if i'm reading words on a page and especially things like a a self-help book it'll be steps one through five and when you get to five you are healed and it's just but you know sometimes you're stuck on that level three and you just can't get by it and i like i like the self-help books that acknowledge this that acknowledge that it's takes a long long time and you may never reach this level five or you may never you may go from level five back to one i just can't stand i can't stand people who talk about mental health as if it's temporary as if it goes away when you do these steps (laughs) 